friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your random access YouTube personality, not that I'm really a YouTube personality, and it is time for episode 7, see, I remembered this time, of my Transistor Let's Play. Attention, this is Future Tessa seizing control of the narrative. So while I was editing this episode, I realised that for some insane reason, all of the in-game audio is missing. I don't know why this has happened. As far as I can tell, it's some kind of inexplicable computer error. And yes, it will be reprimanded. I've tested other recordings since, my setup has not made the same mistake, I don't know why it happened, but since it's basically impossible for me to re-record footage due to the idiosyncratic way this game runs its save system, and since I did in fact have the subtitles on because I put them on for every game I let's play, I figure that this is still usable all you really miss out on is some crashes, bangs, and Darren Corb's wonderful soundtrack. But let's be real, you're here to listen to my lovely voice anyway, or more accurately, past Tessa's lovely voice, and I really think that I should get a lot more screen to- Um, I might be a little bit out of it for a couple of reasons. One is that, hey, it's symptoms time, and I spent the entire night being awake and miserable. Um, the other being, quite simply, that, uh, well, I'll explain it in a second. Persons relocated, 3,709, 3,710. That's a really neat detail. I've never actually noticed these numbers ticking up before. I mean, yeah, it might be terminal. Um, urgent, immediately re Urgent, immediate response requested. Central Authority urges all individuals to provide relocation preferences as soon as possible. Um, wide search. Yeah, this seems like the kind of thing that would happen. So it interestingly says that people are retreating to the country. That's gonna lead me to a point that I'll come back to in a second, which is that I wanted to point out that <laughs> Uh, today we are flying blind, people. I have not done a, uh... I have not... <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, anyway, I have not done a practice run of this area for the simple reason that, um... Well, when I'm doing these Let's Plays, I do a practice run if it's a game I've played before. If I'm blind playing something, I don't necessarily do a practice run, but uh, if it's a game I've played before, I keep a separate save file and do a practice run so that I know where everything is and that I will not actually, you know, miss anything. So that's especially difficult with Transistor because of how it has such an idiosyncratic saving system where... Uh... Now if I aim that right, will I trigger the bomb? I hope so. Let's see. Um... Anyway, it has a really idiosyncratic save system where it auto-saves constantly and loads you directly into your last save whenever you open a new save, uh, whenever you, you start up the game to play again. So, um... Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, um, one of my passive upgrades at the moment means that I have a 25% chance of entering super user state whenever I go into the turn timer, which, um... I've never used before, so I don't know what it does. Let's find out. Huh, I guess it lets you kill stuff. That is an absolute shitload of damage. Huh, maybe I should have been using this all along. Anyway, um... So, Transistor has you, uh, save... Well, it doesn't have you save at all. It saves automatically every time you do most things. Whenever you use a terminal or go to a new area. And then it loads you directly into, uh whichever save you last played. You can juggle between different save profiles, uh, but you have to do so via the options menu. Um, it's slightly hidden. Anyway, what all that together means, ultimately, is that uh, in order to have my practice run, I keep switching back and forth between these save files and guessing at how far I will get while I'm actually doing the Let's Play. I have consistently managed to uh, be wrong put it simply. Um, so with the intention of 20 minute episodes, I have been doing roughly 15 minute practice runs. And uh, those have consistently been longer enough that they've added up to a whole episode's worth of an extra practice run. So essentially, um, the practice run I would have done before this episode, I did over the last several episodes. 
which means that it has been a few days since I played through this content, which means that I am kind of just hoping that I, you know, remember it good and get it right. That was a really long-winded and complicated way of saying something that was not especially difficult to, to explain. Anyway, I'm going to put like four bombs here and see what happens. Because if I detonate all of these at once, will that just completely... Well, I think I've just made these... Uh... It's so sweet. I wonder if he, if it, they were together in life, if he ever confessed his feelings before he became a sword, or if this is all kind of, you know, this is my last chance, so I'm going to say it. And maybe he would never even have said it if he wasn't um, in an altered mental state by virtue of being a magic sword that is being affected by proximity to some kind of a, of a thing. A thing that we'll learn about shortly. Uh, so I'm going to sort these out. So, um... I have slotted a few things, moved a few things around, and I have now equipped double dogs, which I think is the best number of dogs to have. But we've unlocked actually three full new stories, so I'm just going to go through those real quick. Fairy Yondale. Oh no, I read that one last week. Last week? Last episode. Sybil Rise. Age 30, gender F. Selections, supervision, organisation. Reasons cited, I love people. That sounds kind of suspicious to me. I um I love her socialite aspect. I, I feel like she might be a very controlling person given her selections and reasons. There's something like a there's kind of I'm reading a lot into uh one image, but um she strikes me as being kind of glass like and brittle. But in a way that is cutting and powerful. Anyway. Known in elite social circles throughout Cloudbank, Miss Sybil Rice organised many, many of the city's popular public events, from groundbreaking ceremonies to contemporary festivals. She was everywhere, and yet somehow she made the time to lead a second hidden life. As one of the camerata, Miss Rice was responsible for gathering information about potential high-value targets, people who could contribute to their cause. She did this job to perfection, drawing no notice, though one target in particular caused her much frustration. Miss Rise met Red while putting together a small programme for up-and-coming artists and became infatuated first with Red's music and then with her. According to diary entries, there was something inscrutable and confident about Red that Miss Rise could not explain. However, Miss Rise was frustrated to find that Red grew distant. Through all of this, Miss Rise observed the aloofness of one of Red's companions and decided he must have been insinuating Red against her. Miss Rise thought of various ways to rectify this. One night, Miss Rise nominated Red as a target for her camerata colleagues, citing Red's surging popularity in the city and her unusual set of selections. Red could substantially advance the camerata's agenda, and was not yet so ubiquitous that her sudden disappearance couldn't be sufficiently disguised. Miss Rise promised that the camerata could get to Red at a time when she would be completely alone. Trace data reveals an 85% chance she falsified this claim. So yeah, I think they have quite intentionally painted a portrait of someone fairly um, controlling and manipulative here. But, um, I do love her aesthetic. Though I have to admit, it's kind of an ass-backwards way to plan to assassinate your love rival, um, to get the secret society that controls your society to, um, stage an assassination in the hope that he will, by chance, also be there and then also care enough to throw himself in front of a thrown sword that controls reality. Anyway, next guy. Shomar Shasberg. Age 29, gender M. Selections, trickery and comedy. Reason cited, everybody wears a mask, right? I want to talk about this guy's this guy's appearance as well, because um, I've talked a bit about how strong the character designs in this are. There's such a wide variety of unique and interesting individuals, and their character is so well presented through their, their visual designs, their personality, and their role in the world comes across so clearly. It's clear that, you know, the um, classical 1920s music hall comedian or vaudeville performer um, is an influence in this guy's character, but also I th I kind of think he he's a a sort of a Harry Houdini style character, a, a larger than life public personality, and you can tell that from looking at him. Considered the most elusive entertainer in Cloudbank by twelve percent of the population, Mr. Shomar Shazberg earned his reputation through numerous absurd public pranks and other daring or ill-advised feats. Thus, he earned the nickname the Magician from his many thousands of fans and enjoyed executing highly unusual, unscheduled performances in Cloudbank's most bustling neighborhoods. 
His acts grew more ambitious over time, culminating in his promise to skydrop into a restricted region of Goldwalk and walk right out, escaping admin detection. After constructing his personal glider, Mr. Shazberg sailed forth one evening from a high-rise rooftop to the delight of thousands of onlookers at ground level. Onlookers lost visibility of him as he flew into the dense fog hanging over Goldwalk, though their cheering continued for more than 40 minutes. Mr. Shazberg, meanwhile, completed the skydrop very much as planned. What he did not expect was that several individuals were waiting there for him when he touched down. The camper artist saw in Mr. Shazberg someone who commanded a significant influence over a young and vibrant sector of the city's population. Mr. Shazberg, for his part, initially mistook the camerata for an administrative group, and was shocked and disappointed to have been located so easily. His famous escape attempts likewise proved unsuccessful in this particular scenario. Nevertheless, more than 80% of individuals who self-identify as fans of Mr. Shazberg's work believe that his disappearance was all part of the stunt. So yeah, here we learn that um, the admins aren't necessarily part of the camerata or controlled by the camerata. The camerata are a more sinister influence on the city from behind the scenes. Anyway, let's hurry on. I'm sure I was talking about something important, but I don't remember what it was before I went on a lengthy story time diatribe. As a big gay, I don't stand a lot of um, het couples, but I do think I, over the years, I have become weirdly invested in in Red and the Boxer. I have a fun story about that, actually, which is that when I first played this game many years ago, I was... I mean, I've always been good at the thing I do, the whole kind of understanding and interpreting stories, literary crit... And, you know, literary criticism and all that jazz. But um, somehow, when I first played this, I did not pick up on the fact that uh, the voice of the guy in the opening cutscene, um, or that the guy in the opening cutscene and who gets stabbed diving in front of you in uh, the cutscene before the last boss fight that we fought, that that's supposed to be uh, the same voice as the voice of her sword. I was confused for a very long time as to why her, her sword was speaking to her in such affectionate and familiar tones as if they were close friends. Like, how did I miss that? Presumably those are all requests from after this crisis started happening. So I'm going to dip through here, then go back to the back door. What does this say? Symptoms described for. Urgent. List of known process symptoms. Are you or anyone you know experiencing any of the following? Uh, it's amusing to me that you can only pick one of these, even if you are suffering multiple. Uh, that speaks very uh, truly to the automated systems that my local health service has started using, which have a very binaristic view of whether or not you're sick and what your symptoms might be, which makes it very difficult to actually fill out the online forms in a way that helps. Um, it's bad. It's bad design for reasons that I won't get distracted talking about right now. Anyway, um, let's go with forgetfulness. <laughs> Please alert your medical professional. Remain indoors until help arrives. Been hearing a lot of that lately, man. There was a lot of, uh... <laughs> I just... The boxer really does have to do the heavy lifting of the uh, character in the game, since he's talking all of the fucking time, especially when I'm trying to talk. But um, it's good they picked such a charming voice actor to do it. Anyway, maintenance access. All this does is take me over here. It is literally just there as a um, fun reference to the 0451 door code, which is, um, I'll talk about it while I dip in here. So it is a running reference in immersive sim style video games. I 
I mean, Red's not really doing a lot of punching. She's more in the sort of stabbing things in a way that is possibly an abstract representation of hacking them to fundamentally alter their natures. But, uh, you know. Hey, Luna. So, uh, what the fuck was I talking about? Oh, yeah, I was talking about the 0451 code. So, um, basically, it's a running joke, almost, in immersive sims and in games designed by people who admire the immersive sim as a genre, that um, there will often be a door that has a code access, uh, a code to allow you access to it. This is very often um, like a secret door or access to some hidden resources or that kind of thing. But um, most people know it from Deus Ex and most people think it is a reference to Deus Ex when it shows up in other games, like for example, Prey or uh, Dishonored or any other immersive sim, including those not made by Arcane. So um, the thing is, it actually dates back to beloved founding game of the genre, System Shock 2. And um, in System Talk Shock 2, it was actually a reference to the um, iconic anti-censorship novel Fahrenheit, uh, Fahrenheit 451. So it's just an interesting little detail. Like, it's curious that they referenced, you know, the iconic Imsim uh, in joke in a game which is not in any way related to an immersive sim. Uh, the fact that it's also a little pointless hallway that goes nowhere, or um, well, not a hallway, a little access way that uh, just leads you back to where you were before, is also a kind of a reference to immersive sims and the tendency those games have for encouraging you to sneak places through the vents. However, The reference itself is a reference to a reference to a reference, but it's an odd one for this game to make, considering it's not an immersive sim, it's not like an immersive sim, it doesn't really tackle the same themes as immersive sims tend to, because Supergiant, as a studio, have this curious obsession with certain sets of themes, one of which, most notably, is um, cyclical events, the cycles of reality and nature and life and death and all of this stuff. Um, while the, the mechanics tend to be very separate from the narrative and the kind of, like, structural theming of their games, the mechanics, at, at taken entirely separately from the narrative as things unto themselves, do actually usually reflect the themes of the game in certain ways. This is more true for some of their, some of their games than others, but um, it's generally the case. I've completely forgotten what the fuck I was talking about. Anyway, I'm just going to cut uh, cut here until I'm done with these. Anyway, since I already forgot whatever the hell point it was I was trying to make before I uh, got completely distracted and forgot what I was talking about when I brought up uh, the design and the mechanics and the themes that Supergiant are obsessed with as a studio, uh, let's move on. Because really, if you aren't coming to my channel because you want to hear me forget about things, trail off, go on random tangents, Yeah, that's exactly how I am. It's nice, it's nice that this guy gets me. I've never been seen by a sword before, you know? I quite like that because it's a lot more sort of poetic. The Spine of the World is a far more evocative title. And there's that word again that I can't stop using. But um, one of the amusing and interesting things about this game is that the opponents are all named things like Fetch or Young Lady or whatever. They're very strange and idiosyncratic. Also, I like that there's only been 17 unauthorized swims up here. That seems extremely unlikely for a rooftop pool. Maybe a lot of people get permission first. Anyway, um, I'm gonna call it here, but uh, yeah.
I hope you had time in today's um, story times fun time jamboree, but let's uh, let's do this again sometime. Why don't you join me again for the next episode? Thanks so much for watching. Bye. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one tweet micro reviews. Or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.